Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to be able to speak at a TEDx event right here in Loudoun County. I'm Jeff Plattenberg, and I come before you with all of the people who have invested in me, their time, their talents, their wisdom. As with many of you, we wouldn't be here if people didn't share with us what they believed in and seeing things within each and every one of us and our talents and the capacities that we have. So a little more about myself. Uh, this is my dad. My dad is an extremely talented fighter pilot. He is a highly decorated individual, and that means I grew up in the military. And we traveled around quite a bit, so I learned early on to make friends fast because you didn't know how long someone was going to be at the base that you were in, and you didn't know how long you were actually going to be friends with somebody else because they might be going or you might be going uh, sooner than you had hoped. But uh, it was rather interesting. You know, I didn't grow up in the low or the poor class. I didn't grow up in the middle class. I certainly didn't grow up in the upper class. I grew up in what I term as the military class. And I don't know really where that fits in, but it was somewhere in between all of those things at different times, depending on where we were located. This is a picture of me as a wee tot. I'm the little guy, the youngest little chubby one in the middle. Some things haven't changed. But when I, around this time, I'm, I'm a, one of five boys. My brother Scott hadn't been born at this time. But I use this picture just to give you a flavor of kind of like where I fell in the pack. I learned early on that I had to just run to keep up. I have these little, I know they look like, uh, to me they look like tennis shoes even though they're baby shoes, but they have little bells on them. So I think I had a slight disadvantage of trying to keep up with the rest of the pack. And I think I might have been that one child they tried leaving behind. <laughs> This is my mom. I'm very proud of her. She's such an amazing woman. She's been an inspiration not only to me, but to each of my brothers. Um, I'm amazed at the fact that she was able to raise five boys, and each of them being unique and having, uh, during the growing years, a whole lot of testosterone that was difficult to manage at best, but uh, she was very talented at keeping us all in line. I truly call her a Red Cross mom. She was one of those mothers that there was always room at the dinner table. I never knew who was going to be there, and I never knew how long whoever was there was going to be staying in our household. A truly intelligent and inspirational person. So uh, I hit the ground running. I noticed I showed you those little bell things on it, and I've been running for pretty much most of my life. Uh, this is my older brother, Craig. He and I have logged a lot of miles together. I've run over 14 different marathons. I've run an ultra marathon, the JFK 50 miler, and as most runners do, you meet a lot of different and interesting people in your travels. Uh, when you run a marathon 26.2 miles, there's not much to do but kind of talk and try to keep yourself from passing out. But <laughs> each time I run these events, I have learned in the current team events that we're running are the Ragnar Relay Series. Those run approximately 200 miles from one place to another in a relay, and you do it in pretty much a day and a half. And what's exciting or challenging about that is that you're given the opportunity to go ahead and you meet different people. We ran from, uh, last one we did a couple weeks ago, I ran from uh, San Francisco all the way down to Napa Valley, getting back into the vineyard theme. And um, before that, the one I had done before was from Miami down to Key West. This picture here was the New York City Marathon this past year, where they had so many people from so many countries and I'm inspired each time I get to run with folks because finding out why they're running, what it is they're doing it for. They're doing it maybe to improve their health, for a bucket list item, perhaps for a loved one, a loved one loss, or somebody struggling with a severe illness or disease, or for a charitable cause. And if I'm receptive while I'm running, and if I'm willing to listen, I find more and more about the different places people come from and the things that they bring with them, both the difficulties and the positive attributes that just inspire me beyond belief. So as I said, we've logged a lot of miles. This right here is the Go Ruck Challenge. The Go Ruck Challenge is a challenge, it's an event, not a race, where a cadre of folks get together, you know, they say signing up as individual completion is collective, because it teaches you about teamwork, it teaches you about leadership, it teaches you about working together to improve better together. 
Now this was this past 4th of July, as I said, when most people were probably still sleeping. Folks were starting, and they call it a Go Ruck Challenge because you carry a, a rucksack, a backpack. You have 40 pounds that you carry with you, six bricks that are kind of taped up and put in your backpack. And it truly shows the power and the power of everyone. And it amazes me as to how much each one of us individually, what we carry with us, what we bring to the party, if you will. But when we work collectively, we can achieve so much more. Through some of the most adverse conditions, working together to meet obstacles, that's what this race is about, teaching that framework of teamwork. Sometimes under the most adverse conditions, inspiring others to move on beyond their wildest dreams. Because when I see things like this while I'm running, while I'm doing things, I realize that whatever pain I've got going on inside of me, I need to just stuff it in a box because it really isn't relevant. So I'm going to show you a video right here that talks a little more about what the passion is that we have in Loudoun County. What is truly amazing in Loudoun County Public Schools is that we've created an environment where we're taking dollars that we used to spend on building maintenance, on utility bills, and we're able to channel that expense through our energy efficiency programs and initiatives into the classroom. This program has become so much more than we ever really thought it would become. You know, originally it was about, we're gonna save money. It's about keeping money where it belongs, and that is in instruction. Every dollar that was wasted on an unnecessary bill could have been used for a much better purpose, and that's teaching children. We're not just taking money that we would have spent on the utilities and providing classroom materials, but it allows us to afford teachers. It allows us to invest in the student's education. And so we started with that, and then we evolved even further. We took it from investing into the classroom to creating a culture in that classroom for future savings, future investment, future education for the students of that classroom to understand why it's important to make those connections about saving energy, saves money, works towards sustainability, invests in your community. And it created sort of a, a rich learning environment where the students went beyond our wildest dreams and also then taught us how to then kick it up even further, to branch out, make our program even more successful. And that is when you really have the holistic community. We call it acculturation, to where our students get innovative, creative, sharing ideas with us. We basically have this cross-pollination going on so much so, even one of our graduates, a Loudoun Valley graduate, she's now a director at the Environmental Protection Agency. And she's coming back to us when we're re getting recognition for our programs and heralding about what a difference that acculturation, that environment that was rich for her, that stimulated a thought or an interest or an idea, created a passion within herself to go ahead and achieve and be successful for the environment. It just makes it all come back home. What we're realizing today is that the students are going to absorb how it is that we operate our facilities and the habits that we take on while we're inside of our schools. And this consciousness of how they can personally impact the environment is going to be a part of them as they move on into the future. Together, we have created an environment that is just simply amazing. One is beyond my wildest dreams because it's not just my dream, it's all of our dreams. Are you ready? Yes! Yeah. Yeah. Deuce! Yeah. Renew! Yeah. 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 All right! So how did this come about? So when I was given the opportunity to come work here, they already had a great program. It was 15 years running and it was something where it started out for the bottom line. We needed to meet a budget. But I thought, what, what can we do? We need to go ahead and do something. We can kick this up a notch. We can go ahead and improve upon this. So what we did was we brought everybody together across different domains. We bought folks in the construction department, in the transportation department, in the food service department, in the safety security department. We brought in students. We brought in parents. 
And we, we brought everybody in and we said, you know, each one of us individually have amazing talents. All of our talents are unique to us. But let's see what we can do. Let's leave our egos at the door outside and see what we can do collectively. And collectively, let's come up with something that can be even more impactful, can be even better for our environment. And ultimately, let's bring something together that really reduces our costs so we can truly invest in more teachers, so that we can truly invest in the teaching and learning that's going on here every day. So we started about that. That was the work that we got about. And we ended up being incredibly successful to the point where these were competitors who engineering firms, architectural firms, who really didn't want to share it first. But once they started getting comfortable with each other, and once we started communicating and collaborating, and the creativity juices just flowed. So they came up with ideas to where now 42 of our school facilities have Energy Star certification. And what does that mean? That means that they are at the top of the pyramid, and it gets pretty tight up at the top. That means they operate within 25% of the most energy efficient facilities across the country in their peer group. That's phenomenal. That's saving money, putting money exactly where it belongs. And we're extremely proud of that. And so we had these things going on, and then we started with the student groups, they started clamoring about too. They started speaking to us. These soft voices were speaking out. Hey, you guys are doing things we don't want you to do. I'll give you two examples. First of all, one example was recently I was at an event and I'm standing there, I went to get some punch and I go to get the punch and there's a student next to me, obviously a student to me, and he's getting punch and cookies and I'm just getting the punch because I'm, cookies stick with me a little bit longer than they should. And I realize, you know, what, I, I decided to strike up a conversation. I said, well, how was your summer? How'd your summer go? And he says, you know, it was really busy. I, I was really, you know, I said, yeah, they're kind of small now, aren't they? He says, yeah, well, I was saving up money. I was working hard, mowing lawns. I said, well, what, what were you making all the money for? And I'm thinking, okay, the kid looked like he was, he was definitely in high school, was going to be a junior or so, maybe a car or a, a video game or something like that that he might be interested in. He goes, no, I had to buy this spec, this uh, carbon spec that I wanted. And I said, what? What do you mean carbon spec? He goes, well, have you heard of solar power? <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I was in the right place at the right time. And I said to the kid, I said, yeah, I have. In fact, you know, in the 70s, I grew up with a solar thermal panel as a kid, and we put solar thermal and solar photovoltaic panels on our schools. In fact, our Winkomatics, we give back 16 kilowatts to the grid because they're off of it. They're all solar driven. And he goes, well, well that's really cool. I said, well, what are you doing? He goes, well, I saw, I was in this chemistry class, and I saw where if I could go ahead and get this spec and include that little spec inside of these other components, I could go ahead and make a solar panel myself. And I said, yeah, but you know, the amazing thing is the footprint of those things are so big, it's so hard. He goes, that's the point. These are really microscopic. I said, well, how'd that work for you? He goes, well, it was a real pain trying to put all those little things in one little, I said, well, what happened at the end? He goes, it worked. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no. So now, I said, well, what made you do that? He goes, my laptop, I kept you losing my cord. I couldn't find the battery, so I decided, I could get creative and make something like this and it would work. And I just was blown away at the creativity that this young, young student had. Through his quiet voices, big ideas. Then we had this other group, these energy teams. We At Formal Station Middle School here in Lyon County, there was a group called the Green Team. It's amazing how they all call themselves some variant form of that. And this Green Team invited us in because they were really distraught that we were using styrofoam trays. So we went over to meet with them. You know, the principal called me and said, hey, I've got this crew. They're really, you know, student-led. You know, they're really vocal. Do you want to come here? And I said, absolutely, I need to. So I take my whole crew over there, food service folks, and we go marching in in our suits and everything, you know. We're from the government. We're here to help. <laughs> and we give this big presentation about how our food service program had been $2 million in the red and how, as a business model, we had to go ahead and improve it because we're paying for our food, we're paying for our employees, we're paying their benefits, we're paying for the whole program. And the $2 million in the red was sucking money out of the instructional budgets. And so we explained to them the business principles, the metrics that we use, the profit and loss statements. And they sat there and they said, yeah, but, but we really hate these styrofoam trays. Don't you know what they do to the landfill? Don't you know how long? I said, yeah, I, I know all that. The superintendent's been busting my chops to get rid of this stuff. And now you guys, I'm getting it from both ends. 
And uh, I said, but we really have to figure out a way to do it. And so what they did was they came up with different ideas. And the ideas they came up with were inspirational. They found a place where you could press them down and make a frame out of the polystyrene that was being used. One part of the committee went that route. The other committee went and got uh, surveys from petitions from the parents. I had more people respond to the petition that they were willing to pay more money for the food service program than were actually buying meals at the school, which I didn't really understand that. But it got us excited, and we found a company right here in Loudoun County, Virginia, a Danish company called Miltech, that not only we used them for bailing our, our cardboard to recycle, but not only did they do that, but they also had a way to compress all of this polystyrene. And they had a way to make it back into reusable form. Needless to say, we don't use styrofoam trays in our lunches anymore. So out of these soft minds, quiet voices, we had big ideas. This is Daniel Jackson. He is at the American International School of Muscat in Oman. Daniel Jackson had a voice. He inspired his teachers. He inspired his principal. He inspired everyone that he was working with to go ahead and look at the energy. As he walked the halls of the school, he realized things that were going on beyond his coursework, beyond his social life. So they had heard of us, and they invited us from Loudoun County to go out and cross-pollinate and share with them. And when we shared with them our ideas, and he shared his ideas and his research, they are now saving 20% per year on their energy costs, money going back into the classroom. So the challenge to you and to all of us is to be willing to be receptive to these soft voices, whether they're here in Loudoun County, Virginia, or in Muscat, Oman. We need to be comfortable in ourselves to go outside of our comfort zone, to listen, to hear these big ideas, because these big ideas are what changing the world together so when people used to say, think globally and act locally, we can truly say that when we act locally, we are acting globally. On behalf of all the people that support me and bring me and all the karma that they've given me through my life, thank you for letting me impart part of that karma with you today. Thank you very much.